All right, so uh, when this whole coronavirus thing kicked in and we had to move our classes online, I assumed it was not going to be a problem. Uh, got textbooks, got readings, got uh, some content, uh, PowerPoint stuff on Learning Suite. We got email, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I just figured that'll be fine. But uh, as time's gone by, I've realized I actually miss talking about the stuff that we talk about in, uh, in our class, in our history class. Uh, particularly, I realized that some of the topics, some of the lectures at the uh, latter part of the semester like this are actually some of my favorite, the ones I'm most invested in. Um, and I uh, realized, you know what, I'm, I miss chairing that. And I also realized I heard back from some students uh, that uh, um, they wanted a little more, uh, that they needed some things to clarify the textbook, or they went through the PowerPoints that are in the content section of Learning Suite, and they were not sure how certain things connected or what certain things meant. And I looked it over and I went, yeah, I get that. That, I, that makes sense. Um, so I've decided I'm going to do a little video here, right? This is uh, my first real foray into this sort of thing. So it's going to be amateur and probably pretty crappy, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. Um, what you'll need to do as a student, uh, if you haven't, you know, already decided, I don't need to see this guy anymore. Uh, and you're hanging up already. If, if you're sticking it out, then uh, what you need to do is you need to bring up, um, you need to bring up the PowerPoint uh, premises of evolutionary psychology. Like I said, it's the content section in Learning Suite. It's there. Go bring it up because I got it on my screen here. Um, I'm not sophisticated enough to broadcast that part of my screen with the video. So I'm just looking at the PowerPoint and I'm going to go through the PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, you can kind of follow along. I'll try and remember to tell you when I've moved to a new slide or whatever. Uh, hopefully it'll be just obvious and apparent. But uh, anyway, so you're going to want to bring that up and you're going to want to have that uh, here to, to look at uh, as we walk through. So you might want to just hit pause right now. And don't know why I drew that word out quite so long. Maybe something poetic, pause, you know, like I took a pause. Okay, that's dumb. And I'm going to try and avoid making jokes because there's no one here to give me any courtesy laughs. So I'm just going to zoom through this stuff. Anyway, so pause the button, bring up the PowerPoint, and then we'll get started. Hopefully you have done that and restarted now. So what you see is the first uh, slide, right? What is evolutionary psychology? This, I found this on the internet somewhere. I thought it was kind of cute, uh, but it really kind of captures something important about uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, connection with uh, evolutionary history, with uh, the idea that all of the psychological phenomena that are important to us as human beings, uh, you know, laughter, face recognition, beauty, color, sexual attraction, language, humor, all those sorts of things um, are locked away inside us somewhere in, as part of our evolutionary inheritance as uh, higher primates, so on and so forth. Um, you could also think of, uh, uh, of evolutionary psychology is offering up a, a kind of a model that we saw in the, uh, the movie Inside Out with all of the little emotions operating unconsciously that, uh, you know, all of those emotions, right, shame and anger and joy and fear and all those uh, evolutionary psychologists, those are kind of basic emotions that served our evolutionary survival uh, needs and uh, that those really are kind of having an internal dialogue in some sense and dictating our behavior anyway. So that's, that's the silly picture we start with. Things get really underway with the next slide uh, where uh, we go to um, our friend Charles Darwin. He had this to say in 1859. 
right? He said, uh, in the distant future, psychology will be based on a new foundation, that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation, right? So that in the same way that uh, his, his theory accounted for the development of various physical features and traits, uh, he said that uh, there will come a time when psychology will use that same model to account for psychological traits, the development of um, uh, shyness, the development of um, language, the development of uh, uh, all of the sorts of human things we would talk about, all of our traits, extroversion, introversion, uh, as I mentioned, you know, things like that, intelligence, what have you, that the account would show how all of those psychological features also are the product of slow, gradual, adaptive evolutionary processes. Uh, he also wrote on the next slide, we see him about younger, Charles Darwin there. Natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world. Every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and add up, adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working. It's a universal principle, right? It's a mechanical law. It's just there all the time, grinding its way out, making certain things happen. We see nothing of the slow changes in progress, right? It happens far too slow for us to notice. We have to look at it across eons, right? Uh, until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages, he says. He's a great writer. Uh, anyway, one thing that you need to note right off the bat, you need to appreciate, because I think a lot of people don't appreciate this. When, when Darwin says that natural selection, right, this, this adaptive pressure, uh, is uh, daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world, every variation, even the slightest. Right? Okay, this is a, it's a, an, a log an algorithmic process. It just is mechanical. Um, but when he says rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, right? good and bad have very particular meanings in the Darwinian worldview. Right? And those meanings are uh, good equals contributes to reproductive success. And bad is doesn't contribute to reproductive success, right? So don't read those terms in, in kind of a moral sense of, well, natural selection is making sure that really good, wonderful things happen um, and that evil things don't happen. That's clearly not the case. Simply, natural selection is concerned, if you can say concerned, because it really isn't concerned about anything. It's just a principle, right? It doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about anything. It just runs. It just does its bit. Uh, but all that's going on is uh, a selection process whereby things that contribute to reproductive success and things that don't uh, are either in are uh, either selected for and continue or selected against and extinguished and, and weeded out right um, and we're used to that kind of language as far as biology evolutionary biology natural history that sort of thing you have to understand for evolutionary psychologists all of that is true for our psychological stuff our emotions our perceptions our sense of self-identity our behaviors uh the reasons that we give for why we do things so on and so forth uh, we act the way we do we feel the way we do we perceive the world the way we do because there's been a slow process of accretion of adaptive emotions and thoughts and feelings over time that uh, have contributed, they're adaptive, they've contributed to our reproductive success in one way or another. Um, the next slide I have up is Ernst Haeckel. He's a very famous early uh, evolutionary biologist. Uh, and he had this to say, because I want to I wanna make sure you understand not just Darwin's theory of natural selection, but Darwinianism, right, as a kind of whole worldview. Like we talked before in the class about Newtonianism, right? Now we're talking about Darwinism. Right, because there is a—it's more than just a scientific theory. There's an entire material, mechanical worldview here, and uh, and Haeckel put it. Haeckel put it this way: He said, "Nothing is constant but change." Right, 
Uh, all existence is a perpetual flux of being and becoming. That is the broad lesson of the evolution of the world. Okay? Everything is changing. So I, I brought that up because I simply, I wanted to set up and remind you about Heraclitus, who we ran into a long time ago in class. Uh, and his very straight materialist idea, there's nothing permanent except change. Everything is in flux. That's the world. Um, in fact, some historians have, have, uh, have talked about uh, Darwin as uh, Heraclitus uh, reascendant, right? Now, Heraclitus is back on the scene, um, and we, we get with Darwin a very sophisticated, much more detailed and careful Heraclitian account of the world. Everything has changed. There's no fixity of species. There's nothing that's set in stone. Everything is changing. Everything is adapting uh, or dying out, right? That's, uh, it's a constant struggle and always is. Uh, everything has changed. Another uh, next thought, uh, next slide uh, is by Keith Hansen. Uh, he points out again to reiterate this evolution, evolution acts slowly. Our psychological characteristics today are those that promoted reproductive success in the ancestral environment, right? And so everything about you, this claim is everything about you, the way you, the you as a human being are, you're hardwired, right? Uh, that language gets used a lot. Um, genetically determined, uh, evolutionarily predisposed, those, those kind of terms get used um, to feel certain things, to be attracted to certain things and repulsed by other things and to, to behave in certain ways, uh, to perceive the world in certain ways, simply because um, we had certain um, adaptive challenges millennia, millennia ago on the savannah as, uh, as, as hominids, early hominids. We, we had some things we had to face to ensure our success, our reproductive success. And those early hominids that thought or felt or behaved in certain ways uh, passed their genes on. They survived and those uh, who didn't, didn't, right? And so the way we think today, the evolutionary psychologist says the way we think today mirrors that uh, is a product of that. In fact, we're still, most evolutionary psychologists say we're still stuck in those uh, early hominid ways of solving problems and thinking about the world and taking care of things uh, because evolution moves so slowly. Um, there's been a, a kind of a disconnect. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on and clarify some of that. But we, we think and feel and act um, not, the evolutionary psychologists say, not as modern, sophisticated people, but really when you get beneath the veneer, where we're still very much early hominids on the savannah struggling to survive. Uh, and that's manifest in the things we feel and the way we do things, the way we perceive stuff. Uh, next quote uh, from Eric Fromm, he says, it's human nature, though being the product of historical evolution, has certain inherent mechanisms and laws to discover which is the task of psychology. Right? So again, just saying, this is, this is why we want to understand um, psychology from an evolutionary point of view. It will, you know, human identity, human psychology is a product of evolutionary processes. Uh, the same processes that are operative in the biological world are operative in the psychological world. We want to study those mechanisms that produce the behaviors and thoughts and feelings that we have and the laws that govern all that. That's what psychology should be about. Okay. Uh, Steven Pinker, this next uh, slide here, I don't, I don't, I guess his name is in there somewhere, but uh, he had this to say. He's uh, kind of a, a strong proponent of the view. Evolutionary psychologists seem to want to unmask our noblest motives as ultimately self-interested. To show that our love for children, compassion for the unfortunate, and sense of justice are just tactics in a Darwinian struggle to perpetuate our genes, right? But that's really what's going on when you get the story out, when we get past the, the folk psychology story that we tell ourselves about what we're doing really. There's this evolutionary process going on about uh, the struggle to perpetuate our particular genes. Uh, one last one, David Buss, very famous uh, evolutionary psychologist. He, uh, he had to say this, he said, killing is fundamentally in our nature. Um, so the murderousness is part of human nature because over the eons of human evolution, murder was so surprisingly beneficial in the intense game of reproductive competition, right? Now I use that uh, because you could plug in just about anything. You could say lying, 
You could say loving, you could say uh, caring for your children, you could say uh, being a responsible citizen uh, and neighbor. You can fill in the blank anywhere in that sentence you want and it still works because that's, that's the evolutionary psychological story. Okay, so that background, that's just quick intro to evolutionary psychology. Uh, and it, the reason we're dealing with it is because we're connecting something that was articulated uh, originally, the seed idea was articulated in ancient Greece, with Heraclitus, Democritus, and so just those guys, the materialists, uh, but gets, uh, gets firmly uh, articulated and uh, becomes widely popular in Western culture in the 19th century with Darwin and his followers and his advocates. And then uh, today in psychology, evolutionary psychology is, uh, is increasingly popular. Um, I've been in this psychology teaching game long enough that um, I can remember when, you know, the, the intro psych textbooks just went straight to the biological basis of behavior chapter. And now I'm increasingly seeing these intro psych textbooks all the, before we get to the biological basis of behavior, we have a chapter on the evolutionary basis of behavior. Or you get entire textbooks now that are written explicitly from an evolutionary perspective. So, uh, and this is, this is fairly, fairly recent uh, in the development of our discipline. Uh, so it's important to know where this all came from, what its implications are, that sort of thing. That, so that's why we're talking about evolutionary psychology and looking at it in context of Darwin, who we usually would think of as a biologist, right? Um, what's he got to do with psychology? Well. A couple of things. One is this move in psychology towards an evolutionary account of psychology, but also Darwin, you know, he kind of kicks it off. One of his most important works um, that uh, most people don't talk about was the expression of emotions in men and animals, right? It was early on. He wanted to provide a psychological account of emotion and their expressions and that sort of thing. It was in work in evolutionary psychology. Took us a long time in psychology to get really super excited about being explicitly Darwinian, but we're there now. Um, okay, so next slide, two items on it. Uh, theoretical premise and philosophical premise. Important we make this distinction in order to help you understand this. Um, a theoretical premise is a basic postulate or basic uh, assertion. Usually it's very explicit that we find in a particular theory or model or explanation of something, right? And I'm gonna walk you through some of the theoretical premises of evolutionary psychology, okay? Uh, but we wanna contrast uh, theoretical premises with philosophical premises. A philosophical premise is a basic assumption it's beneath a theoretical premise, right? It's a basic uh, a philosophical assumption and it's usually implicit. Uh, it's often not acknowledged, right? We don't even sometimes realize it's an assumption. It, we just kind of take them for granted sometimes. And it's that basic assumption or set of assumptions upon which a particular theory or explanation of something is founded, right? So we've already talked about some of these philosophical premises in class. We've talked about determinism. We've talked about reductionism, mechanism, materialism, a whole bunch of isms out there. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here, is that um, that you you develop a theory to account for why people do something, right? Why they feel the way they do, or behave this way, or what have you, right? And you come up with a theory. And psychology is full of theories. We have them all over the place. And but those theories, they're undergird underneath them. There are some philosophical assumptions that often aren't acknowledged as assumptions. They're just taken to be the case. This is the way it is. Um, sometimes they're acknowledged, sometimes they're out in the open, but often they're not, right? Um, so we got these two kinds of things. And what I wanna walk you through uh, next here is the theoretical premises of evolutionary psychology, right? And then we're gonna talk about some of the philosophical premises. So there are, there are six theoretical, theoretical premises of evolutionary psychology to talk about. And these 
uh, I didn't, I didn't write these up. I didn't intuit these. I, this is not me. This is, I've taken this directly from evolutionary psychologists talking about their theory and what their, what their starting premises are, or at least what they think their starting premises are. I think there's other starting premises deeper, but this is where they would start. Okay. One, human behavior can and should be explained at both approximate and ultimate level of analysis. And only evolutionary psychology can do this sort of thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in that, that statement, that premise, proximate and ultimate. I want to make sure you all understand what proximate and ultimate is. Proximate is, uh, well, let's think of dominoes, right? We've laid out some dominoes on a table and we push the first one. And brrr, we go through all the dominoes to the last one, right, that falls over. Uh, and we feel wonderful sense of accomplishment of having destroyed something by tipping it over. It's anyway. Uh, so, proximate. The first domino to fall over is the proximate cause of the next domino falling over, okay? The last, the, excuse me, the next to last domino is the proximate cause of the last domino falling over. They're right next to each other. First one right in front, proximate. This knocks that over. This is the proximate cause for that, right? The first domino falling over is the ultimate cause of the last domino falling over. The ultimate, it's the starting point, right? So what evolutionary psychology says that we should be explain human behavior both in terms of its immediate causes, what's taking place in the environment at any given moment, and what the brain is doing as you're feeling a particular emotion, so on and so forth, proximate causes, but also ultimate causes. Life back on the savanna as an early hominid trying to solve an adaptation problem so you can stay alive and pass your genes on, right? How do I... How do I avoid getting eaten by that beast or killed by Grog, who's part of my tribe, or whatever the case is? How, how do I steal Grog's woman and have more children, right? And all of those, those early hominid adaptations, those are the ultimate causal accounts of our current behavior. So we've got to take care of the proximate and the ultimate. And the claim is that only evolutionary psychology can do this, that all the other branches of psychology, whatever their contributions, never go back far enough to get our ultimate causes, all right? Two, 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 okay, two, four, no, two, two. Domain specificity. Tricky, for, tricky language, but this is what it means. Adaptive problems are always solved. Right now, adaptive problems, remember how to reproduce, how to stay alive, how to maximize the chances that my offspring will survive. Those are adaptive problems. How to get what I want, how to get what I need to keep uh, living and producing and so on and so forth. Adaptive problems are always solved through specific designated physical and behavioral structures or mental mechanisms, right? So they all, Evolutionary psychologists often call them uh, psychological mechanisms, right? So our problems, how do, we, how do we navigate the world so that we survive and pass along our genes? Those problems, however they happen to show up in our particular situation, are solved through specific physical and behavioral structures. That's, that's traditional evolutionary biology. Or psychological mechanisms ways we think, the way we perceive, the urges we feel, the emotions that play through us, right? That's, that's more than traditional uh, evolutionary biology. That's now evolutionary psychology. And so evolutionary psychology wants to bring all of that together, right? Third, these mental mechanisms, these psychological mechanisms, they're innate. There is no genetic variation in them between people. So we are all hardwired the same way, right? Again, let me go back and use a goofy example um, of that, that wonderful little movie, Inside Out, right? Uh, the little girl, she has these uh, five uh, little emotional beings 
running around inside her. She's not aware of it. She's not conscious. She just feels stuff, right? She just behaves. She just does stuff based on how they're operating, right? But they're in there, right? And uh, at the end of the movie, there's a uh, little short scenes where you get to look, uh, you get some access to other people, her parents, the pizza delivery guy, whatever. Anyway, you go, uh, the young guy, young kid who's trying to talk to her at the hockey rink, whatnot, get inside their heads. They all have the same five, right? There's some variations in them as persons, but they all have the same five beings facing five basic emotions driving all of their behavior and their feelings and their perceptions of the world so on and so forth right so it's, it's kind of like that idea that uh, we all have the same mental mechanisms just like as human beings we all have the same dna now there's variations in how dna is is um uh coded up in particular ways right um, but we all have the same DNA and much of that DNA, um, has to be as it is for us to be walking upright, have, uh, fingers, toes, mouth, all the brains, the way we are, all that stuff. Right. So there's the, the, if there's anything was significantly different, we wouldn't be humans. Right. Evolutionary psychologists are making the same case about our psychology. To be human is to have these basic psychological mechanisms. Everybody has them. Um, and they explain, in an ultimate sense, why we do the things we do. Next, four. Next uh, slide. Human nature is best explained as the sole product of the interaction of genes and environment. Okay. So evolutionary psychologists are going to say, look, everything about human beings is explained best, most completely, most adequately, as solely the product of the interaction of genes and environment, nature, nurture, causally connected, just making things happen. There's nothing else. There's no, there's no freedom. There's no creativity. There's no, there's nothing. There's no soul or spirit or you know, purposes, any of that stuff. It's just genes and environment causally working together to produce the behavior, the feelings, the thoughts, the actions, the desires, whatever you are, have and are, right? Fifth, right, fifth one, the workings of evolved psychological mechanisms are automatic, right? Most are not available to consciousness. What that means is, just like the little girl in Inside Out, right? Anger and fear and, and disgust or shame and the joy and sadness and all. They just, they're doing their thing all the time. And she's not aware of it. In most cases, we're, they're not even available. We couldn't even bring the stuff to conscious awareness. It's all unconscious. It's operating at a biochemical level for the most part. Uh, and it just does what it does. And so we conversely, where our behavior and our thoughts and our feelings are also automatic just the simple product of these uh, internal forces, right? Uh, these evolutionary forces. Then sixth, the last theoretical premise of evolutionary psychology, the last one that there's been a state straight up, this is where we're coming from, is this. There are differences. And this is the important, this is a really important one for them. There are differences between the current and the ancestral environment. We don't live on the, on the savannas, the way that our, pre our early hominid ancestors did, our prehistoric ancestors. We live in a different world. Our, our environment is very, very different, right? So see something funny happen is that um, when consciousness came on the scene, and don't know how that happened really, but consciousness somehow magically emerged and people then have language and self-awareness and they begin to think about the future and they develop a tribe and they develop relationships and uh, then they start to come up with laws and they, you know, and there's creativity and artwork and I mean, culture, boom, culture's on the scene and culture moves really, really fast. And so we have created for ourselves in a really short period of evolutionary time, a whole new world that's radically different than the one that our, our early ancestors were in. They faced different problems than we do. 
they experienced a world that was very, very different from the one we've created for ourselves. But the problem is, the problem is we're still governed by the evolved psychological mechanisms from that early period. And so there's a disconnect. We're programmed, we're hardwired, we've evolved in the way, not just in, in our biology, but in our psychology to address certain reproductive problems and challenges in an environment we don't live in anymore. And so weird things are going on, right? Um, and that's uh, an interesting conundrum for the evolutionary psychologist. They want to answer that question. Look at that stuff. So I got a, uh, I got a couple of quick examples I'll share with you to kind of show this, right? Uh, the first one uh, is called Bananas and Parking Lots, right? This is from a study that was published uh, about a decade ago in the American Psychologist by a researcher named Kanazawa. And uh, he's an evolutionary psychologist. And this is, I have a couple of quotes from him here, right? He says, Adaptations, physical or psychological, are designed for and adapted to the conditions of the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, not necessarily to the current environment, right? It's a really terrible sentence. I wish he were a better writer, but that, sorry. Anyway, I mean, adapted to adaptiveness is okay. And what do we call those? What do we call those adaptations? Okay, whatever. Anyway beyond the jargon, right? Uh, what color is a banana, right? Just a goofy question to ask somebody, what color is a banana? We say, well, a banana is yellow, right? And as he says, a banana is yellow in the sunlight, in the moonlight, it's yellow on a sunny day, on a cloudy day, on a rainy day, it's yellow at dawn and dusk. You change all of that lighting, the context, we still perceive it as yellow. We perceive bananas as yellow, right? But then he says, but uh, a banana looks yellow under all of those conditions except in a parking lot at night. Try it sometime. I've had students went out and checked it out. They could go to Walmart. Uh, only don't do that if there are people around anyway right now. So he says, under the sodium vapor lights commonly used to illuminate parking lots, a banana does not appear naturally yellow. This is because the sodium vapor lights did not exist in our ancestral environment during the course of the evolution of the human vision system. And the visual cortex is therefore incapable of compensating for them. We haven't had sodium vapor lights long enough for our visual cortex to uh, adapt, to, to mutate and be selected for, you know, so on and so forth. So we don't, we misperceive or, or we perceive the banana uh, as a different color in that condition, right? So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, that evolutionary psychologists like to focus on these oddities and say, oh, look, here, um, here's evidence that we're still perceiving the world the way our ancestral hominids did. Um, and we haven't, we haven't adapted to some of the cultural and technological things that have taken place. Uh, our psychology is still lagging. Something as basic as how we see things in certain arenas is still stuck in the prehistoric past. Um, another, uh, another example, this one is uh, called the Cinderella effect. It comes from work by Daly and Wilson. Um, is the alleged higher incidence of different forms of child abuse and mistreatment by step parents than by biological parents. Evolutionary psychologists describe the effect as a remnant of an adaptive reproductive strategy among primates in which males frequently kill the offspring of other males in order to bring their mothers into estrus and give the male a chance to fertilize her himself. Okay, so uh, the idea here is what they did is they went and did some research, I believe they did it in Canada with Canadian families, and they found out that an instance of child abuse, uh, of all the instances of child abuse, that overwhelming, like a hundred times more frequently, it was a huge difference, right? A hundred times more frequently, were stepchildren, right? That stepchildren were being uh, abused in the home so much more than, than uh, non-stepchildren. And their argument then is that, well, this is, this is evidence of, you know, our early hominid life, which is you have, to, uh, you have to kill off. You can't take care of, you can't be invested in the offspring of some other male, right? Uh, you have to be uh, uh, interested solely in your own offspring, in your own, and so much more likely that you're going to abuse or kill 
stepchildren than your own children. That's their argument, right? Um, we may have to talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so walked through the theoretical premises, now we're to the philosophical premises. Philosophical premises. Remember, these are the deep underlying philosophical assumptions that are sometimes not even noticed. Um, got three of them here, three biggies. And we've talked about these before, but I'm going to go through them again, remind you. Number one, reductive naturalism. Evolutionary psychology is rooted in the philosophical assumption of reductive naturalism. All those previous theoretical premises are founded on, they're rooted in reductive naturalism. The notion that only physical and material things exist, and all, thus all explanations of events must be in terms of the operations of measurable physical forces and material bodies, right? Natural evolutionary processes operating on DNA, that's, that's the story. That's all there is, is the, the natural physical world of measurable things. Two, material mechanism, right? Matter is subject exclusively to the causal operations of mechanical, physical forces. Right? So we're just material organisms operating in a physical environment governed by mechanical, natural laws. And so all of our behavior, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our fears, you name it, everything about us, psychological, our very identity is the product of matter being governed by, causally governed by certain impersonal, mechanical laws. Remember earlier slide, right? Natural selection is working all the time. It doesn't sleep. It's constantly grinding out, selecting things that are adaptive and not adaptive and making the world as it is, right? Three, necessary determinism. All events that occur, right? And so when events, when I'm talking about events in psychology, I mean behaviors, feelings, thoughts, that stuff, right? All events that occur do so as the necessitated product of one or another natural causal process. And as such, must be as they are, cannot be otherwise, right? That's the necessity part. Remember we talked about proximate causes and ultimate causes. They necessarily determine everything, right? So human behavior is just like the dominoes that I talked about earlier. They're approximate and there are ultimate causes and the Dominoes just fall. They can't do otherwise. They can't resist it. It just, it's dictated. It happens as it must happen. Our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our relationships with others, your belief in God, uh, your, your desire to be a, a psychologist, right? Your, all of those things, your fear of spiders, whatever, all of that is as it must be. And you cannot be otherwise given your biological and evolved psychological inheritance. And those are, those are at the root, those are at the bottom, right? And often not fully appreciated or defended, right? Uh, articulated in any way by evolutionary psychologists. Well, the next, the next um, slide, <clears throat> slide number 16, I guess it is, uh, conceptual problems, right? So now we're getting into uh, okay, let's think about what we just learned. We learned all this stuff. Let's think about it for a minute. One of the things you have to pay attention to is that evolutionary psychologists, and they're not alone in this, lots of psychologists do this. Lots of uh, the behaviorists do this, the cognitivists do this, the social psychologists do this, right? The neuroscience folks do it. It's not just evolutionary psych folks, but one of the things that you can see in evolutionary psychology is, what, is that they use what uh, we would call a scientistic rhetoric. Now, scientism, I think I've mentioned it in class before, but if I haven't, scientism is just the notion that science is the only viable approach to knowledge, that all of our problems and questions will ultimately be answered through scientific means. And so philosophy, religion, art, literature, policy, all of the other things that we do are either don't matter, they don't really give us any real knowledge, or they're they're more we should be more skeptical about them right they're less reliable but science is the be all and end all and so what you get with a lot of evolutionary psychologists is a scientific rhetoric right because they're committed to naturalistic reductionisms and all of this 
and the notion that science reveals the causal natural order of things and and is the most rational way of making sense of the world. Well, you get language like documented or demonstrated or the data shows, right? And that, that language use clamps it down immediately on any, or at least attempts to clamp down on any, any serious questioning of the findings or the theory. Right. So what you, you have is an evolutionary psychologist will go out like we looked with the Cinderella effect or the bananas in the parking lot or a whole host of other things, mating strategies, uh, what have you. Right. And I'll say, well, our research has documented this or demonstrates or the data shows that as though there's only one interpretation that can be made and it's the evolutionary interpretation of the data. As though the, the, their use of science has simply gone, they've, they've gone up and they've taken a snapshot of the world the way it really is, not the way religious people believe, not the way philosophers believe, not the way, you know, Joe down the street or, or your Uncle Teddy, not, it's the way it really is, that science gives us that picture and this is a, a way of documenting and demonstrating, right? what must be the case. So you start to get that language, right? And that language uh, helps, helps convey a whole bunch of philosophical assumptions and values. Uh, objectivism, right? The notion that uh, the, the evolutionary psychologist is, doesn't have any values, doesn't have any perspective or prejudices or biases or, or no agenda at work here. It's just just observing and reporting, just taking snapshots of this is the way reality is. And gosh, I wish it weren't like that, maybe in some cases, because, you know, uh, one of the things that men are uh, predisposed to because of our evolutionary heritage is to, to uh, naturally want to rape women, right? And that's unfortunate. I wish that weren't the case. But hey, science, it's just, I'm just telling you how it is, right? Uh, materialism, right? Well, you're just just your brain it's just the genes just that's the way it is you right? know determinism as we talked about psychological egoism I mean, everybody's self-interested self-interest is it genes uh drive us that's all that we even though we may not be aware of it ourselves that's what we're driven to do is to look out for number one right to ensure propagation and reproduction and so on and so forth instrumentalism that's an idea it gets serious right well people just use each other and the things we do and the things we value uh, serve only as tools or instruments, as means to some other end, right? The ends of reproductive fitness. Uh, so some of those some of those isms there that uh, are listed, those kind of come along when you adopt a scientific rhetoric, right? You start acting as though all of those isms are the way the world really is, and you're just reporting it, not this is the worldview you've endorsed, and this is how you're interpreting the world based on that worldview, right? That's dangerous. That's dangerous when we forget that we're articulating a worldview. And we think we're just, just telling the truth as it is, just the facts. It's just the facts, man. That's all I got, just facts, right? Um, when in fact, plan words there, we're offering an interpretation that's grounded by some assumptions that we haven't defended, right? We haven't articulated. We just assumed, we just brought them in and we assume, you know, we go on. These are all particular values, right? Valuing science as the only method to arrive at reliable truth is not a value neutral value. It's a value, right? It's, uh, and it needs to be defended, right? The claim that the world is composed of physical entities only and that those entities are deterministic in nature is, is I mean, that didn't fall on the retinas of your eyes. You don't, that's not some just fact of nature that impinges on your senses and demands. It's a way of interpreting nature, right? Based on philosophical assumptions, again, that often you don't even defend, but need to be defended. So that's a conceptual problem. We need to be careful of that scientific rhetoric, especially, um, especially the, the data speaking for Well, the data shows, right? This idea is a problem because, and I really want you to understand this, to be a good psychologist, 
to be a good consumer of psychology, to be a good consumer of science. From here on out, no matter what you do in your life, please understand this, data does not speak for itself. Right? All data must be interpreted. All the results of your study must be interpreted. And the interpretation is gonna come from a perspective. It's gonna come from a framework full of values, full of biases and prejudices and intentions and so on and so forth. It's never pure. It's always gonna be interpretable uh, and must be interpreted. And, and, and here, more than just that, more than just that the results of my study have to be interpreted. A lot of people would agree with that, right? But more than that, the method you use to do the study is a form of interpretation, right? Scientists interpret their results, but their methods are forms of interpreting the world too. Let me give you a quick example, right? Um, the, the experimental method that we're so fond of in psychology assumes before you do any experiments at all, before you've operationalized any variables before you've uh, made your independent variable, dependent variable, set up your groups, any of that stuff. Before The method itself assumes, it's built on the assumption that the universe is composed of variables, quantities, and that those quantities are in cause and effect relationships with one another. That's why you do an experiment, is to find out which variables you presume exist in the universe naturally, are causing other variables to do things, right? It's built into the method, is the assumption that the universe is composed of variables and that those variables are uh, in cause and effect relationships. Now, it's not just that a researcher might look at his experimental uh, results uh, and interpret them deterministically, it's that the method itself is already leading to that because the method assumes determinism. It doesn't demonstrate it, it doesn't prove it. The method interprets the world deterministically and then the scientist has no problem interpreting the results deterministically. But that doesn't mean determinism was true, it means it was assumed. Before you interpreted your results, when you picked your method, you already have your assumption about the world going. So you're not letting the data speak for itself, you're creating the data according to certain philosophical assumptions you have, certain values, right? And then when you get the data, it confirms your values. It confirms your assumptions, right? Uh, so that's important to understand. It's one of the reasons why I'm not impressed when one of my colleagues comes along and says, well, you know, we've spent uh, 120 plus years now, 150 years almost, uh, as psychological scientists studying free will, and we find no evidence for it. Well, of course you don't find any evidence for it. The experiments you've been running all assume it doesn't exist. I mean, it makes no sense, right? Well, I, I want to prove, uh, I want to see if there's evidence for free will. So I'm going to use a method that, in, that assumes there's no such thing as free will. And look what I found when I finished my experiment and got my results all together. Hmm, doesn't look like anybody's choosing anything, right? It's called playing with loaded dice, right? Um, and it's a problem. Right, William James, who I'll talk about another time, has some stuff to say about that. But anyway, so data doesn't speak for itself. So be suspicious whenever someone says, "Well, this shows or that shows or whatever." Think back. Let me let me walk you back while I'm at it. Let me walk you back to the Cinderella effect. Right, data is always overdetermined. There's more going on. Right, there's more than one interpretation that's available to any set of data you find. So we look at the Cinderella effect. The evolutionary psychologist has already assumed evolution to be true, has already assumed the, the assumption to set up the research, looks at the data, set it up, looks at this, the numbers, and then goes, well, obviously, the reason we have so much higher incidence of abuse of stepchildren is because our early hominids, reproduction, so on and so forth, right? It confirms the assumptions that were baked into the research from the beginning. Um, but there's nothing in the data itself that, that we have, we have families where abuse is taking place and some families, unlike other families, have much higher rates. I mean, there's nothing that demands an evolutionary account of that. For example, one way you could look at the data without in, invoking anything about evolution theory is, well, step families, we're dealing with step families. 
there's a pretty good chance that there's some problems in those families from the get-go. Um, you have divorces, you have blending new families, we have struggles, uh, whatever uh, uh, family problems uh, led to the demise of a previous marriage are probably getting brought into a subsequent marriage and exacerbated all of the relational things trying to, I mean, all of those things going on. Of course, families that are in that kind of turmoil and struggle are going to experience turmoil and struggle. We don't have to invoke genes at all. We don't have to talk about early hominid ancestors and their problems to make sense of our current situation, right? Now, I'm just saying, the data didn't dictate an evolutionary explanation. There are other ways, right? Because the data doesn't speak for itself. Does that mean I don't have any assumptions or biases? Nope, I got them too. We all do. It's all there. It's baked in. So let's be clear about what they are. Let's all be upfront and open about where we're coming from. I come from a position that takes agency seriously, that takes human relationships as meaningful in and of themselves, uh, and values immediate context and its purposes and meanings, right? Okay, so I'm going to give a different account of the very same data set. But I'm offering it up as my interpretation of that data. And uh, not just uh, you know what the data says or what the, the research study has demonstrated. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. All right, I talked about this once before in class a little bit. If you adopt reductionism uh, or determinism, which evolutionary psychology does, well then human agency is out the window, folks. There is no such thing as freedom, as possibility. Everything's necessary and everything is mechanical. And if human agency is out the window, then people aren't responsible for their actions, their thoughts, their feelings. Things just happen. And uh, if things just happen as they must, if, if we're just like dominoes falling or over uh, or rocks rolling down hills, then there's, the, our actions don't intrinsically mean anything. They just happen, right? Um, they, just, they just don't have meaning. They don't have purpose. They, if, if, a, if an action, if an event, if it can't be otherwise there, then it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, because it's only in an event's being otherwise than it could have been, right, that we now have a comparison. We say, well, this isn't that, or it could have been this, but it was that, right? Why are you, why, why are you genuinely grateful to someone who does something nice for you, helps you out? Would you be grateful to them if they could not have done otherwise, if they had to do it? They were forced to, whether they were aware of what caused them or not, but they had to and they couldn't do otherwise. Would you be grateful? Are you grateful to gravity? Are you grateful to the walls holding up the roof? No, they just, it's what they have to do. The laws of nature make it happen, right? If a rock rolls down a hill and it misses you, do you thank it? for getting out of the way, right? No, he said, Ooh, well, that was lucky. Yeah, lucky, just chance, right? But if, if a person who helps you could have ignored you, could have insulted you, could have done a little less or not done anything at all, but they did that, they did this thing that was helpful to you that they didn't have to do, well, then we're grateful for that because it means something that they did it, because they could have done something else that would have generated a different meaning. Well, if you take reductionism seriously, you take determinism seriously, as so much of psychology does, not just the evolutionary side, but across the board, human life doesn't have any real meaning. We might create meaning subjectively, but hey, the meanings we create and experience they're produced by our brain anyway. In fact, I've read some evolutionary psychologists who argue that the very experience of meaningfulness in life uh, is uh, produced in us evolutionarily because organisms that feel like uh, life has meaning, they struggle to live longer and they reproduce more. So meaning isn't real, it's just an instrumental function, right? Well, morality is a kind of meaning. If things are as they must be and couldn't be otherwise, then you can't say this is a bad thing and that's a good thing. Right? Uh, this just happened and that happened. The best you can come up with is, well, I don't like that, but I like this. 
So this is good and that's bad. This is good and that's evil. That's the best you could come up with, right? But you certainly couldn't say um, murder uh, or rape or being rude to other people or whatever is intrinsically immoral and wrong because if, if you, all you can say is I don't like people who do that, right? I find it icky, right? But you can't say it's immoral because at the end of the day, remember back when we were talking about Darwin at the beginning, what's good or bad is what's adapted and not adapted, not what's genuinely in some cosmic sense, right or wrong, good or evil, right? So morality's out the window. If all those things are out the window, if agency, responsibility, meaning, morality, if those things are out the window because of reductionist determinism are taken to be true, nihilism is the result. Nihilism, or what I might call meaning death, right? Let me talk a little bit about nihilism. Let me give you an example. The next, uh, next slide is entitled Nihilism. Right. This is a quote from a philosopher and uh, very important philosopher, right? Uh, Bertrand Russell. Um, but he was a nihilist and he was a materialist and so on and so forth. And he wrote this: that man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. Right. There's no purpose to Darwinian evolution. It just stuff just happens. It doesn't care about you. Just there's no plan of salvation here. Right. There's just things happen. Ha, it, that man is the product of causes that had no prevision <clears throat> of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, just randomness, right? That no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling, no love, right? Can preserve individual life beyond the grave. It's just death. When the atoms stop moving, it's over that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy or science or psychology which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Now, he's being a little literary there at times. He doesn't really mean the soul the way you and I might think about soul. He is talking about human dignity, human identity and purpose, right? Only by recognizing the meaninglessness of it all, the absurdity of life, the randomness and contingency of it all, can we then get on with living and, you know, be as, as reasonably happy as we can be, controlling our environment and learning how things work. Right? That's nihilism through and through. Um, and of course, the title of the essay it came from is a little bit ironic to my mind because he's talking about how we're entirely the result of mechanistic causes. And then he titles, he titles his essay, A Free Man's Worship. I don't, I, I don't understand what he was thinking. Maybe he's trying to be cute, but uh, anyway, I got some cartoons next that uh, I'm gonna leave those for you. You can read them. I think they're hilarious. I have a weird sense of humor. If you don't think they're funny, that's okay too. But I go through a couple of cartoons. Um, so, now we've talked about scientism, and we've talked about reductionism, determinism, all the consequences, nihilism. Here's the last one I want to hit you up with to get you to appreciate it, because it's not enough, folks. Well, got to know this, okay? I can't stress this enough. It's not enough to just study the history of the discipline and <clears throat> log the names and dates and the isms and just move along. We have to reflect on all of that. We have to think back, okay, what, what are the implications? We've, we've studied some of the assumptions and the practices and the claims of a particular school of thought. Okay, what are the implications? And we've been talking about the implications here so far. What's the, what are the implications of assuming scientism? What are the implications of reductionism and determinism? Where does that lead us if we do this? If we take evolutionary psychology seriously and the Darwinian worldview seriously, where does it take us? And if it takes us to nihilism, 
which I think it does, right? Despite all of the intentions of evolutionary psychologists, despite probably the intention of Darwin himself, this is where it leads. If that's true, then here's the biggest conceptual problem I see with evolutionary psychology. In fact, with any psychology committed to reductive naturalism, mechanistic materialism, and necessary determinism. Any psychology, whether it's cognitive neuroscience, whether it's co just cognitive psych, social psychology, behaviorism, you name it. This is the final stage. If you take all that seriously, and we usually don't, we usually don't think it through to the end. But if you do, you get to this, number four on this slide, the end of science. Science is over, it's done. Science as an endeavor to discover truth, to make sense of the world, is a waste of time. Let me explain why. Okay. Um, now, there's, there's a, a, a whole bunch of quotes I have here, and I'm going to maybe not hit all of them, but I want to share some of them. This next one in green here is by Patricia Churchland. She's uh, an evolutionary philosopher and psychologist. She has training in both areas, and she had this to say, and it's really profound. Looked at from an evolutionary point of view, the principal function of nervous systems is to enable the organism to move appropriately, right? To move. Boiled down to essentials, a nervous system enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. Okay, now those were her words. I didn't mess with the quote. She was being clever and cute here, right? Fornicating, right? To reproduce. Those are the four Fs. That's the, the essentials, a nervous system. This is what's essential about having a nervous system like we have, uh, like any organism has, to enable success in those four areas, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. The principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they should be in order that organisms may survive. Now, here's the money pool. Truth, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. That comes, that's way behind. The most important things if the evolutionary story is true, is a nerve, having a nervous system that helps you to feed, flee, fight, and reproduce. Discovering the truth, knowing what's true, who knows what any of that might be. That's not, we weren't designed, we were designed by natural selection to reproduce, to adapt not to discover the truth about the world, not even to be interested in. In fact, deception, many evolutionary psychologists would argue that we're hardwired to deceive others and ourselves because deception is the way you ensure reproductive success best. Now think about that because if your theory doesn't apply to you, yourself, and your activities, there's a problem. So this theory this evolutionary worldview, it has to apply to what the evolutionary psychologist is doing, right? Can't exempt himself, can't exempt herself, right? And that's the irony here with Patricia Churchland, because what Dr. Churchland just uttered was what she takes to be a truth. And yet she has, in her truth, indicated that who knows what truth is? So this is She's exempted herself, said, well, truth, who knows what, that's everything we do is to serve feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing, except what I'm telling you right now. Except what I'm telling you right now, this is the truth, is that all we're designed for is feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. That's the truth, and I discovered it through my science, my rational uh, investigation of things. I'm not telling you that just because I want to reproduce with you. But if her theory, if her account of the world is true, if we take it seriously, She's not telling us the truth because she's discovered the truth. Who could know what the truth is? She's just like the rest of us, hardwired to feed, flee, fight, and reproduce, not seek truth. Who knows what that is, right? So why should we take her seriously? Why should we believe this truth claim? How could we even know it's true? If it was false, but it helped her feed, flee, fight, and reproduce, she's going to believe it. And if she's right, then we're going to believe it if we think it helps us feed, flee, fight, or reproduce. Whether it's true or not, right? It's, there's an irony there. It's a really profound one that most people don't point out, don't think about. Well, there's, uh, there's some more here that I'll, I'll do real quick. David Livingston Smith, uh, the uh, book he wrote was Why We Lie, The Evolutionary Roots of Deception, right? 
Evolutionary biology does not endorse the popular and reassuring conviction that human minds are tools for self-knowledge and the pursuit of truth. The human mind evolved for the very same reason that all our other organs evolved, namely because it contributed to its owner's reproductive success. Nature selected those mental capacities that helped spread our genes, and those that proved unhelpful were ineluctably snuffed out. As any seducer knows, honesty and reproductive success are not necessarily good bedfellows because deception and self-deception helped our species to succeed in the never-ending struggle for survival, natural selection made them part of our nature. We are deceptive animals because of the advantages that dishonesty reaped for our ancestors and which it continues to secure for us today. The irony, David Livingstone Smith is one of those deceptive animals because we all are, right? Either he's some different species than the rest of us, or he's a deceptive animal too. And in which case, why should I believe anything he just told me? Why is it not possible that he is lying to me? Well, his answer is going to be, no, I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth because I've arrived at the truth. Yeah, but you said, David, you said we're self-deceptive as well as deceivers. How do you know you are not deceiving yourself? If what you say is true is true, how could you ever know it? And how would anyone else ever know it? How would we not be riven by skepticism top to bottom? Why should we believe you? See the problem? I hope you're seeing the problem here. Well, there's more. I'm going to go past uh, a number of quotes here about the nature of, uh, of lawfulness and causality and that sort of thing, because we've talked about some of that before. The quotes are really good quotes and, and worth reading. They're very clear. Uh, but, uh, but we get down to, to uh, Patricia Churchland again. You know, in all instances, our behavior is caused by brain events. Uh, Michael Gaz Gazaniga, right? In neuroscientific terms, no person is more or less responsible than any other for actions. We're all part of a deterministic system that someday in theory we will completely understand, right? So usually, I said before, usually the, the assumptions are not explicit, the philosophical premises. Here, some of these folks are being pretty explicit. Gazaniga, Gazaniga is being pretty explicit about this determinism thing, right? He doesn't defend it. At no point in his work have I ever read him making an analysis to defend the concept of determinism. He simply asserts it. It's the way things are. We're all part of a deterministic system. <clears throat> it's just the way things are. Right? I, if I get the chance someday, I'm going to ask him if that's really true or it's just something his brain made him say. Um, and what, did, what scientific research did he do that proved this? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, continue on. Right? If that's true, if it's true that uh, we're just, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires are produced by our brains, which were produced by evolutionary processes uh, and have certain psychological mechanisms, all of which is meant to facilitate reproduction and fighting and fleeing and all of that. Well, if that's true, then there's really nothing else important about us. There's nothing here that matters, right? And so that, I got a couple of other quotes there for you. One from Lucretius uh, and one from a much more recent uh, uh, evolutionary uh, neuroscientist, right? Um, a, he says, uh, even though it's common knowledge these days, among his group of friends, I guess, it never ceases to amaze me that all the richness of our mental life, our religious sentiments, and even what each of us regards as his own intimate private self, is simply the activity of these little specks of jelly in your head, in your brain. There is nothing else. It's nihilism, right? There's nothing else. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. It's just little specks of jelly, your brain doing stuff. Well, if that's true, as Dr. William Provine says, if that's true, that nature has no detectable purposive forces of any kind. The world is organized strictly in accordance with deterministic principles of chance. There are no purposive principles in nature. There's no purpose. There's no meaning. There's nothing. There's no plan of salvation. There's no plan of anything. There are no gods and no designing forces that are rationally detectable. There are no inherent moral or ethical laws. Human beings are just complex, marvelously complex machines, right? There is, as he ends, there's no ultimate meaning for humans, right? Now, this is a guy who's defending the view. It's not someone like me who's critical and saying, well, what about meaning? Now, this is, this is one of the more ardent advocates. We got no such thing. 
Well, what's that got to do with science? The end of science, Dr. Yant, get to the point. You said you would tell us the end of science business. Well, here it is. And this argument comes uh, originally from C.S. Lewis, but I want to walk you through it. It's got seven parts and, uh, and it's pretty powerful. It's called the argument. Uh, well, I, don't worry about that stuff. What philosophers call this argument is irrelevant. Just focus on the idea. One, step one in the argument. No thought, no idea, no theory, okay? No thought, idea, theory is valid, is true, is valid. If it can be fully explained as the result of non-rational causes. If I can fully explain an idea in terms of non-rational causes, then it's not true or false, it just is, right? Two, if naturalism, if reductive naturalism we've been talking about, if that, that worldview is true, then all thoughts can be fully explained as a result of na non-rational causes, right? If naturalism is true, then everything we think, every thought, idea, theory we've ever had is the result of random neuron firings, brain chemistry, genetic uh, sequencing, right? and the non-purposive mechanical grinding out of natural selective processes over evolutionary history. That's all it is, right? So if naturalism is true, if that claim is true that the evolutionary psychologists make, well then all of our thoughts can be explained in terms of non-rational. There's nothing else, right? We saw that in some previous quotes. Therefore, just a little syllogism here, this, this, therefore. Therefore, if naturalism is true, then no thought is valid. None of our ideas, none of our thoughts, none of our theories, none of the things we believe or hope or dream or care about are true. They just are, right? One doesn't look at a rock and say, oh, that rock is true. No, it just, it just is. It's there, right? And you don't look at a rock and you say, oh, that's a good rock. That other one's an ugly rock. No, rocks just are, and they're they're the way they are based on certain mechanical principles operative in the natural world. It's just a rock. It's not a good rock or a bad rock. It might be good for my purposes. I, I got to have a heavy rock to hold this down or whatever. A little rock, go a nice flat circle and then skip. But in and of itself, right? Same thing here. If naturalism is true, the way the evolutionary psychologists say, then no thought, no idea that we might ever have is true or valid. Its validity is irrelevant, right? Well, the argument continues. If then, if so that's first one, doesn't if no thought is valid, if no idea or theory, no model of the world is valid or true or even could be known to be true, then here's the problem. Then the thought naturalism is true is not itself valid because it's just a theory, it's just a thought, it's just an idea that popped into our heads, right? And we share it with other people. But if the thoughts that pop into our head, pop into our head for no reason, they just are the product of causal forces that don't care about our thoughts. I mean, natural processes don't care what you think of them, right? The brain doesn't care about the ideas that it generates for you to think about. So it continues, therefore, if naturalism is true, then the thought naturalism is true is not itself valid. So do you see the problem? It kind of eats itself up. It's coming back to itself here. It's kind of, it's like, it's like sitting on a limb of a tree and sawing on the wrong side. Right? When you cut all the way through, you fall with the branch. Right? You're sitting on a branch and cut through there, boom, you're gone. It cuts itself off from rationality, right? from any source of truthfulness. That's the problem of naturalism. So if naturalism is true, then our thought that naturalism is true isn't true. It's absurd. It's just gibberish. It doesn't mean anything. Because why would anyone say it or believe it? Well, because they're evolutionarily predisposed to do so. Apparently, organisms that believe it uh, live longer. 
I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Six, a thesis, an idea, a theory, a worldview, a claim about truth, whose truth entails the invalidity of that thought that it is true, ought to be rejected, and its denial ought to be accepted. That has to be a basic principle of a rationality because it, if 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 that doesn't if number six isn't at the center of human rationality then it's all just a waste of time we're just deceiving ourselves and each other it's all a lying game there's no truth there's no human reason there's nothing and uh, c.s lewis like i said formulated this argument originally the conclusion is therefore naturalism ought to be rejected and its denial ought to be accepted we ought to reject naturalism outright. We ought to reject any naturalistic approach to psychology, to science, to the world. Why? Because naturalism leads to nihilism, which leads to irrationality, non-rationality, absurdity, right? You cannot believe naturalism is true and say, I know it's true because I rationally arrived at that conclusion, because naturalism a basic premise of naturalism is there's no such thing as rational inquiry. Rational inquiry requires free beings capable of weighing alternatives and making choices. It requires deliberation, real deliberation, not genetic or biochemical or evolutionary causality. So if you take naturalism seriously, as so many evolutionary psychologists do, you have to give up on science. What does science become? It doesn't, it's in science isn't the passionate search for truth, the careful observation of the world to try and discern what it all means and how it all works. It's not the most rational thing we do. It's just one more strategy that has bred evolutionary reproductive success as we've adapted to our environment. It has no utility, no meaning, no purpose, nothing grander than that. The problem is there isn't a single evolutionary psychologist in the world who would say that about science. They value it. They love science. They love the rationality of science. But if a human rationality is just one more survival mechanism, an evolved psychological mechanism, whereby we navigate the world so that we can fight, we can flee, we can feed, and we can fornicate, then that's really all science is about. But that can't be what science is about. So I want you to consider carefully a commitment to naturalism. Before we jump on that train, know that the last stop is Everything is non-rational and purposeless and meaningless, and there is no such thing as truth. There's only the nature of red and tooth and claws. We struggle to survive in a competitive environment. And falsehood, if it helps us survive, is better than truth if truth leads to our demise. Okay. Well, I'm done. I realized that was super fast, but I hope it was helpful. If you have questions, if you're like, whoa, I had my hand up, but what is that about? What are you talking about there, Dr. Gant? Go to Digital Dialogue in Learning Suite. Fire up a question. I'll respond, right? Uh, my TAs will respond. We'll get to you, right? We'll go back over this if you need it. But uh, uh, I hope it's been helpful. If, uh, if it hasn't been helpful, please tell me. I don't want to waste people's time if this isn't helpful. But if it has been helpful, let me know that too. I want to know how we're doing and what more we can do for all of you. But ho I, my hope is this has been helpful to walk through this, to put some context into the readings and kind of maybe connect some dots for you so that you see it all fitting together. Plus, I've been tucked away here in the house, not being able to hear the wonderful lilting sounds of my own stenorious voice. So I had to do this. I don't know if it's helping my reproductive success, but I've had to do this. Goodbye.